Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we return to our study in Judges chapter 9, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance so that we may more properly understand the symbols and the symbolic events that are occurring within this chapter and how it relates for us today. Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we come before you with grateful hearts. We thank you for the many blessings that you are providing. We thank you for the blessing of this morning, of the opportunity of being able to open your word and to study together with like-minded believers. We thank you for this opportunity to rightly divide the word of truth. Help us now, Father. May your spirit attend us. May your angels surround us wherever we are. Direct us in this study. Help us to understand the symbols that are presented. Help us to look upon this and learn so that we may more properly learn that which we need to know for this time in this earth's history. Direct us now, be with us so that we might come to a, a, a greater knowledge and be able to use this knowledge to more properly reflect your character to all with whom we come in contact. For this, Father, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Where we left off yesterday, we have the situation that was occurring. Where Zebul said unto Gaul, where is thy mouth, wherewith thou saidest, who is Abimelech, that we should serve him? Is not this the people that thou hast despised? Go out, I pray thee, go out now, I pr go out, I pray now, and fight with them. And Gaul went out before the rest, before the men of Shechem, and fought with Abimelech. <clears throat> so Gaul has had things to say about the validity of Abimelech. He has gotten the men of Shechem to agree to turn from Abimelech publicly. And now he is going out from Shechem to fight with Abimelech. And as we see in verse 40, and Abimelech chased him, and he fled before him, and many were overthrown and wounded, even unto the entering of the gate. Now, the premise that we've been using is that Gaul and Abimelech are representational of messages. Does that now also mean that Zebul the one that Abimelech placed over the city is also a message. Well, it would have to be. Okay. And so we, we, had, we, and we had determined that um, the way that Zabal acts is sort of a, a sitting on the fence kind of position. Right. You know, the time will tell idea. Which, you know, is something that in this, in this movement is just, it's something that it's a sad situation, but it's something that shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. So in this battle between these messages, in the fallout from these messages, 
Many were overthrown and wounded, even unto the entering of the gate. Can this apply to those that when they observe that a message is going forth, whether it's true or whether it's false, that there are going to be those that will accept this false message and be completely taken by it and overthrown, and that there will be those that will be touched by this false message and be wounded and be able to be healed and recover. Yeah. Now, the entering of the gate, because we know that a gate is like a place of judgment, right? right? And exactly. this could be representing like a close of probation. Right. Okay. Which, which of course, is ultimately coming. And... Well, <clears throat> is it ultimately coming or is there yet a, a close of probation that comes in stages? Well, it comes in stages. There's no doubt about that. But the close of probation is, that comes in stages is always for the wicked closing their probation. You know, so when we talk about the close of probation where, you know, let him that is righteous be righteous still, let him that is filthy be filthy still. Um, we know that that is, is a one-time event. Okay. Right. So that's the close of probation where God's people who have been sealed now are going to have their sins blotted out. They can't bring them to remembrance and they go through the time of Jacob's trouble and the plagues. Um, but there is a close of probation that happens. People close their probation when they completely reject light and and also of course people's probation closes at death but here the entering of the gate this to me is that period of time that would be represented from the sunday law to the close of probation you know um in a, in a bigger scale in our line it's just any kind of close of probation which which happens for people as they reject light. Okay, so to ask this question in a different way, in accepting the leadership of Abimelech, was Shechem righteous? No. Now we it was, reckon it was, a, it was a rejection of a message. Right. It was a rejection of a message. Yeah. Was this any different from the rejection of the message of the 490 weeks of Daniel 9 in the application with the leadership of the Jewish church at the time of Christ? Yeah, you mean the 70, 70 weeks? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, it would be the same type of thing. But there, there comes a close of probation. I mean, just because a message is rejected doesn't, ultimate, doesn't immediately close a person's probation. So the Jews, at the end of the 70 weeks, their probation was closed. Right? Right. But they had that three and a half, well, even seven years, if you want to look at it, in which... Um, they had an opportunity to accept Christ. But hadn't, hadn't the leadership begun to close its probation at about the time of the birth of Christ? Well, uh, I'd have to say no. I mean, begun, it depends what you mean by begun to close their probation. Uh, I mean, a choice was made there. Right. Right. But when we look at a line, if we're going to take the line of Christ and if we're going to take that line there and we're going to start it with the birth of Christ and end it with the stoning of Stephen, I mean, definitely you can have that as a line. Right. The Sunday law would be the cross. And the close of probation would be the stoning of Stephen. 
but you still have a time at the end. That's the birth of Christ. And yet there is, just like in 1989, the church makes a decision, right? Right. Um, they, they don't recognize what's happening prophetically, but their probation hasn't closed. I mean, yeah, they're taking steps towards the church's probation closing. But that's the first angel's message. It's a message of warning. They're, they're be gi given a message that's giving them an opportunity to see something. When the second angel arrives at 9-11, they've rejected that first message. And so the church structure has now rejected the first angel's message. And the structure is, I mean, it's in a sense been passed by at 1989, but definitely by 9-11, it's been passed by. It no longer as a structure uh, can stand, right? Agreed. Right, because it, it's mess, missed that way mark. It's, it's rejected the first angel's message. It would have to accept the first angel's message and the second angel's message, but it's rejected the first. And then this is the period in which the church is rejecting the second angel's message, right? When the third angel's message arrives, I mean, they're going to, we obviously we have the Sunday law coming up, but we know 9-11, so it depends which line you're looking on. But the Sunday law is the close of probation in the line that we're talking about. That's the close of probation for the church. So the church's probation, Seventh-day Adventists probation closes at the Sunday law because that's the complete rejection <clears throat> of the second angel's message and the arrival of the third. And then, of course, we have the period after the Sunday law to the close of probation, which is the general close of probation for the world. So, so when you look at any line, it's, it's going to have a progressive three-step testing prophetic message, which has a close of probation with the arrival of the third angel. But it's not just happens in one day. There is a period of time in which people have this opportunity. We, we have no disagreement on that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just, yeah. I'm just trying to clarify it for everybody listening. So when we look at this line in our history, we have a line that we, we, we have many different lines that we can look at, but in the context here of the message of Abimelech, this is an internal enemy or an internal message that does lead to a close of probation. Wherever that is, I don't know specifically what event would mark that, but we know that there is going to be the entering of the gate, and the entering of the gate would represent a close of probation, a judgment that results in a sentence, so to speak. Correct? Agreed. Yeah. So I know that Odilio, when he was doing his presentations dealing with um, – uh, Collins prediction, right? He he basically said that you know those that reject um, the message of Trump, they can't wait until the election to decide. Uh, they have to make that decision now. And he believed that there would be a close of probation for those that reject the message of Trump being reelected. At least he suggested it. You know he wasn't really strong about it, but he was suggesting that 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 was the case. And, and I don't think that we can, we can sort of delineate when somebody's probation is going to close because it depends on the light that people have. But we do know that there comes a point in which there is a point of no return within a message. You know, we, we had that for November 9th, uh, and it seemed pretty clear that as far as a symbol in a message, November 9th was a close of probation which would be very similar to the close of probation that happened for the Protestants in 1844 with April 19th, right? So there is this progressive close of probation that happens within a line. But, but when we mark the close of probation in a line, um, we usually mark it uh, much later, right, in the line. That is, there still is a door that's open for those because people can receive the first second and third angels message in a short period of time i mean this was part of the confusion with parminder's message regarding his uh his lines 
I don't know if that's helpful, if that makes sense to people, if anybody has questions about that. The point that, that I think is being shown here, mm -hmm. given, given that we have Gal, we have Zebul, and we have Abimelech, all being messages, mm -hmm. would these be a false first, second, and third angel's message? Well, well we're saying that the message of Abimelech is a, third, a false third angel's message. Correct. Um, so if you're going to take the message of Gaal, then, and Zabul, um, how would you place them as far as being first, second, and third? You'd have to explain that. Abimelech being the third. <clears throat> Ga Gaal. is not giving honor to Abimelech. So it would be a false second angel's message. And Zebul would likely be then in that, in that type of a pattern, a false first angel's message. But they're not happening in that order. No, they're happening in, in kind of a reverse order. Yeah. Couldn't you just have... Um that in, in the message of Abimelech, it's sort of a, a repeat of history. It's its own zooming into a way mark. Could be. And that way we just have a first, second, and third. Abimelech's being the first, Gaal's the second, and Zabul is the third. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure matters exactly how we look at it. But in, in, in this context of understanding the lines, because that's what this study is about, we know that we can zoom into a way mark. So Abimelech is, you know, we can say in our history, we're in the time of the third angel's message. We're in the time in which the Sunday law occurs. But our line, that line from 1989 to the second coming, is a zoom into the Sunday law, law way mark itself. Because Ellen White um, is not seeing our history in the sense of part of her line. Third angel arise October 22nd, 1844. It's joined by the other angel of Revelation 18 at the Sunday law. But we have it, of course, our history is a zoom into that Sunday law. So we could look at Abimelech's message as a zooming into a way mark. Um, so, uh, you know, so we can say it's a false third angel's message, but in a sense, it could be the repeat of history that our line is because we have, you know, we have multiple lines here. But if we're going to compare it to our history right now, we're tied up in this, this line. However, we, we haven't really defined it yet in how, the different elements of the line. Um, but we're in the part of the line from July 18th to midnight, right? But we're zooming into a way mark, right? Because remember, July 18th parallels Samuel Snow's final letter that's published on July 18th. And we have that period of three days before midnight. And so we know that our history is Samuel Snow's history in that context, the, the Samuel Snow's letters. But we know Samuel Snow also stands at midnight in the midnight cry, which we would still have to understand as being future. Right. That is, we, in that line that Jeff had created, where we have midnight in the midnight cry, um, that still is a future, future events. And yet some people are trying to put us after those events. They're looking for the Sunday law, to be coming this year, but we don't even have midnight and midnight cry happening yet. Yeah, agreed. Right? Which, which to me is just a, a major problem because we know that midnight and midnight cry have to do with a message to the Levites. 
So where is that message to the Levites? It hasn't occurred yet. So to me, I look at this Judges chapter 9 as referring to our history during those periods of three days, which here it's described as a period of three years. So it's that symbol um, relating to uh, the same as the three days in the story of, of uh, Ezra chapter 10 and other periods of three days that we've looked at. It, three days is a symbol of the prediction before midnight. So that's, that's where we still stand in this sort of symbolic time, um, which we've tried to say is, is actual, and, and we can't do that. But anyway, um, that's how I understand it. I think that's what we've learned since July 18th. It's become clearer and clearer. Okay. So Gal went out before the men of Shechem and fought with Abimelech. We have two messages that are in opposition to each other. Mm -hmm. They are not in unity. And Abimelech chased him and he fled before him and many were overthrown and wounded, even unto the entering of the gate. Yes, I recognize that's a repeat of what I've read just a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. And Abimelech dwelt at Aruma, and Zebel thrust out Gaul and his brethren, <clears throat> that they should not dwell in Shechem. So Abimelech has been made king at Shechem, but he does not dwell there. What is there about this message that is now? taking residence at Aruma. What does Aruma mean? Well, it's the heights, or I shall be exalted. Okay. And so Zebul has done his job and thrust out Gaul and his brethren that they not dwell at Shechem. So Zebul is casting out Gaul. And this is a civil authority. Correct. And Gaul is this bitterness, this loathing. The Hebrew, I, I, I just, the, the Hebrew name itself just is, is choking on bitterness, which would describe some of what we've seen. But this is going to happen at a, at a higher level or, or more intense, I think, as we proceed through this history. We're going to see this bitterness manifest. Okay. And it came to pass on the morrow that the people went out into the field and they told Abimelech. So after Gaul and his brethren are cast out of Shechem. The following day, the people go out into the field. Why would this be important? What, that it's the following day? Yes. Okay. In, in a situation like this, you know, when, whenever I'm hearing about, and I'm, I'm putting this literally at this point, the following day, people in a field. Did we ever see something like that occurring in Adventist history? Well, you have the, dis the great disappointment and you have um, Hiram Edson in the cornfield. Right, and that's what I was thinking of. Mm -hmm. So this is a type of disappointment. Correct. Okay. I'm asking. I'm asking that question. Yes. Yeah. 
I mean, it definitely could fit when you start looking at the three companies. We have to figure out what they mean. Right. And he took the people and divided them into three companies and laid wait in the field and looked and behold, the people were come forth out of the city and he rose up against them and smote them. Now the he is important here. The he is giving reference back to Abimelech. It is not giving reference back to Gaul. It's not giving reference to Zebul. It's giving the reference to Abimelech. So Abimelech has taken the people. He has divided the people into three companies. He's chosen, choosing to lay wait in the field. He is not surrounding the encampment. They're laying wait in the field to see what else is going to be is going to occur. And they looked and they beheld the people were come forth out of the city, and he rose up against them and smote them. So Abimelech is laying in wait against the people of what city? Well, this is Shechem. Agreed. Yeah. Now, and it says when they told Abimelech back in verse 42, uh, that would be referred to Zebul and his party. Okay. You know, that's Zebul, the people that are... Right? Would you agree with that? I don't see that I could disagree yeah. yet. Yeah, because when the people go out in the field, they're not telling Abimelech. This is the bull who's telling Abimelech. So Abimelech is laying in wait against the very people that selected him as king. Mm -hmm. Would you have a problem with that? No. And Abimelech and the company that was with him rushed forward and stood in the entering of the gate of the city. And the two other companies ran upon all the people that were in the fields and slew them. Yeah, so he bought, blocks the entry into the city and then he just... Blocks, he blocks their way of safety. Yeah. Now, in comparing Abimelech with the third angel's message, the third angel's message provides a manner of safety at the time of the end. Right. Is anyone blocked from accepting the third angel's message? No. I mean, you have the first and second, obviously, if they reject those, they can't accept the third. But this is a message that actually hinders rather than helps. Agreed. I mean, as, as we have all read, those that reject the first angel and the second angel's message cannot be benefited by the third angel's message. Mm -hmm. The situation here with Abimelech, instead of dividing people into three companies to cast out the Philistines, you have someone that is, you have a message that is dividing those of a specific city against their neighbors. Yeah. So this is antithetical to, antithetical to uh, Gideon's message. Exactly. where Gideon offered a message of hope 
to Israel. It was also a message that was of the coming judgment against the Amalekites, the children of the East, and the others that had joined against him. The Midianites, the Amalekites, and the children of the East. Here, we're dealing with a message that is against the very people that placed Abimelech above them. So you have one company that's blocking their, their route of escape and their way of safety, and you have two others that are coming to destroy them. Judges 9.45, and Abimelech fought against the city all that day. So he took the city and slew the people that, that was therein and beat down the city and sowed it with salt. Why is this important for us to, to consider? Weren't those that were with Abimelech and with Zebul living in Shechem at that time? Well, yes. Um, I mean, we had... Gaal and his brethren that were cast out of Shechem, but the other people weren't. Right. So this message is providing a A death sentence on those in Shechem that do not fully agree with Abimelech that had chosen to listen to and accept the message of Gaul. Okay, from the chat, Matthew 5. 13. Why is this important? The mountain of salt. It just reminded me of that verse. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is therefore thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. So the city is rendered sterile. People are being judged. Well, part, part of the prophecy that was spoken against Abimelech was also spoken against the men of Shechem and the house of Milo, which was, what would we say, the council chamber of the, of the city of Shechem? Yeah, something. It'd be kind of the leadership. Yeah, yeah. So, so I have a problem here. I mean, it's not a problem, but just trying to sort this through. So, you have Abimelech. He's elected by the men of Shechem. Represents a message, and this is a message that's opposed to the message of Gideon, which is the message of July 18, 2020. And then you're going to have um, a three-year period symbolic period of time there that uh at the end of that period there becomes this evil spirit between the men of shechem and abimelech so this so the people who have accepted this message of abimelech now are dissatisfied with it and then you're going to have this uh loathing gaal another message that's now going to rise up demonstrating this bitterness towards Abimelech and his message 
right, the message of Abimelech. And then you have Zebul, who's the civil authority in the city of Shechem, and he's going to um, communicate with Gaal, but he's really sitting on the fence, and he's going to see who's going to win this battle. And when Abimelech wins, he thrusts out Gaal and his brethren, right? So, you know, it's kind of unclear, like, which side he stood on in reading it, but we could see that this is that time will tell attitude, the people who are waiting to see sort of who wins the battle. And then you're going to have now Abimelech. He's going to come against the people of Shechem. Even though Zabal has thrust out Gaal, that is the enemy of Abimelech, Abimelech is, um, he's going to come against Shechem. So why does he do that? That's what I don't fully understand. Because he's won the battle. He defeated, you know, Gaal's army. Zabal's going to thrust out Gaal. And yet Abimelech's going to come and fight against the city of Shechem. Why? Well, oh, I think it's, it's vengeance. <clears throat> yeah, it sort of seems a bit misplaced in some ways. I mean, he's not doing anything to win himself to the people of Shechem. He's been a terrible leader. Well, he reminds me of Satan, and he's very inspired of Satan, because Satan will entice us to sin, and then he'll really uh, punish us in the sense for sinning. He'll torment us and lead us into more sin. Like, he'll entice you to do something, and then he'll accuse you of the thing that you've done and not provide an out, whereas Christ will convict us of what we've done, and we repent and we re receive his 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 forgiveness but there's absolutely no forgiveness with satan right so, so yeah I, yeah so this message yeah. this false third angel's message is unchristlike in it in how it deals with the sinner there, there's nothing redemptive about this message Agreed. This would look to be a message that leads only to destruction. Mm -hmm. So this makes it consistent with what follows then um, in the symbolism. Right. Now, what was interesting is as I went through this, from what the translators had used when when they're looking at this about the beat down of the city we would look first at deuteronomy 29 23 and that the whole land thereof as brimstone and salt and burning that is not sown nor beareth nor any grass groweth therein like the overthrow of sodom and gomorrah Adama and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and in his wrath. Now we also have 1 Kings 12.25 and 2 Kings 3.25. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein and went out from thence and built Penuel. And then 2 Kings 3.25 and they beat down the cities, and on every good piece of land cast every man his stone and filled it. But they stopped all the wells of water and felled all the good trees. Only in Kerharaseth left they any stones thereof, howbeit the slingers went about it and smote it. But added to that, we would have Ezekiel 4, 47.11 and Zephaniah 2.9. Ezekiel 47. 
but the miry places thereof and the marshes thereof shall not be healed. They shall be given to salt. And in Zephaniah 2.9, Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab shall be as Sodom, and the children of Ammon as Gomorrah, even the breeding of nettles and salt pits, and a perpetual desolation. The residue of my people shall spoil them, and the remnant of my people shall possess them. In sowing the city with salt, the symbol would seem to be that this was being said that Shechem was destroyed forever. And it was similar to calling it a slime pit and a marsh. Why would this be important in this story? Isn't Abimelech trying to show his great power? that he is not going to allow anyone to oppose him. How do we approach this? Um. Okay, what's this Tower of Shechem? Okay, we haven't gotten that far yet. I'm asking yeah. first in Judges 9.45. Yeah, well. Yeah, I don't know. So Abimelech is supposed to have beaten down the entire city. Now we're given this picture. Here is this message of Abimelech. He's now gone against those that would make him their ruler. So in other words, the message is saying to those that accepted the message, I am yet even greater than you thought. And when all the men of the tower of Shechem heard that, they entered into a hold of the house of the god Berith. Now, we've identified this in the past, that this was Baal Berith, the god of the covenant. But now we have the men of the Tower of Shechem. So this is something different. A tower or a stronghold or something that hasn't been destroyed. Well, wouldn't you have two things that haven't been destroyed? The Tower, well, the house, of, the tower of Shechem and the house of, of God, Baal Bereth. Yeah. What do we see here and why? I mean, the next verse said, and it was told Abimelech that all the men of the Tower of Shechem were gathered together. The Tower of Shechem be the state and the and the temple of Baal Bereth, the church. No. 
um, I understand what you're saying, but this Tower of Shechem, this would refer to a, a part of this movement. Because this is the Watchtower. And it says there um, that they entered into an hold of the house of the god Bereth. And, this, and the hold is in the sense of clearness of vision, a citadel, a high place, a hold. So in both of these symbols, this is something in where they're, they're getting a, a view of things. And, and this is a part of our movement. They're getting not just a view, but they're getting a good overview. Yeah. They're giving, getting a complete perspective. Yeah, I mean, it almost seems to be pointing to, a, for lack of a better word, a showdown within this movement uh, to correct um, the message. But it, it's it's a rather con, well, convoluted or a complicated sort of story. Because you know okay. you can have this, a certain woman who casts a casts a piece of millstone, a piece of a millstone upon Abimelech's head, and all to break his skull, right? So there's this um, all this thing these things happening that. You know, after the message of July 18th, you have this city of Shechem, the movement that listens to a false message. And, and these are all the things that happen as the result of that. But ultimately, that message is, is conquered. But there still is a price to pay for that. And Abimelech got him up to Mount Zalman, he and all the people that were with him. And Abimelech took an axe in his hand and cut down a bough from the trees and took it and laid it on his shoulder and said unto the people that were with him, What have ye seen? What ha ye have seen me do? Make haste and do as I have done. And the alternate reading, what ye have seen I have done, make haste and do as I have done. So he's taking an ax, he's cutting this bough from the trees, and he lays it on his shoulder. But why did he get himself up to Mount Zalman? Why is that important for us to note right now? Well, Mount Zalman, I mean, it means shady. It's a wooded hill in Samaria near Shechem. Um, mentioned in Psalm 68:14. Okay, Paul, right. Called Solomon there, but right. Um, when the Almighty scattered kings in it, it was white as snow in Solomon. So now, in, nine, in 949, we are told, and all the people likewise cut down every man his bow, 
and followed Abimelech and put them to the hold and set the hold on fire upon them so that all the men of the tower of Shechem died also about a thousand men and women. So those that were following Abimelech have now chosen to accept this message and to follow exactly what the message is telling it to do. So in this separation, in the death of the men and the women in the Tower of Shechem, could this also be applied as a type of casting out? Hmm. I mean, it's just see. You, I mean, you see that the message of Abimelech is ultimately destructive, right? Um, but but you know, in trying to understand who these people are of Shechem, I mean, the, it's part of the movement. I don't know if it refers to a persecution that occurs. I mean, and then you're going to see it with the city of Tebes. The same thing, a tower, and they want to burn down that tower as well. Well, okay. Comment from the chat is looking at this with the bows as being a type of false cross bearing. And then as, as we are progressing, as you were just noting, and then Abimelech to, then went Abimelech to Thebes and encamped against Thebes and took it. So Abimelech, the message, has now gone against Shechem and is now against Thebes. But there was a strong tower within the city, and thither fled all the men and women. So all of the civil and religious powers fled to this strong tower. And all they of the city and shut it to them and got them up to the top of the tower. Okay. So why would you say civil and religious? Just because men and women? Yes. Yeah, I, I don't see that in this context, though. I don't think that's what it's representing. Okay. Because this is still something within the movement. And um, I mean, this strong tower would be some kind of message that uh, would be a correct message. Okay. But this action against Thebes occurs after the third year of Abimelech's position. Yeah, yeah. So we have the, th the three years. This is at the end of those three years that this is occurring. So this would be for this movement something still future. And Abimelech came under the tower and fought against it and went hard unto the door of the tower to burn it with fire. So this false message, mm -hmm. this false third angel's message is going to fight against this message that is protecting the men and the women of Thebes. Now, what, what does Thebes mean? Uh, well, it means um, 
whiteness in the sense of something that's bleached like a cloth so that in that means then also conspicuous that is it would be conspicuous because of that okay but in revelation 3 what are we told to buy white raiment okay right so that's it's the righteousness of christ so the message of Phoebes is the message that makes one white, that makes one righteous. Yeah. So would this be the true third angel's message of righteousness by faith in its purity? Because the false message can't defeat it. Yeah, so this would be the correct message that's going to be fought against by Abimelech. Okay. And he won't defeat it. Right. So this false message came unto the tower and fought against it and went hard unto the door of the tower to burn it with fire. And a certain woman cast a piece of a millstone upon Abimelech's head and all to break his skull. So a certain woman. What's important about the certain woman and what's important about the piece of a millstone? Okay, so one is the word certain is ichad which is um, means a one in the sense of unity, right? So we've got ichad and yochid, these two words that can be translated as one. Um, but ichad is, is the Lord our God is one Lord. Okay. Or it's, it's unity, right? So here we have a certain woman. Uh, so this is one woman but it's symbolically this idea of unity. So this is a united church, a group that's united. Okay. That casts a piece of millstone. So when I was presenting civil and religious as being the men and the women of Thebes. Yeah. That was a no, but this woman is in unity and is a church in unity, so that's a yes. I'm okay, so the way that I looked at the men and women, um, it's just the context, because we don't have a civil authority here. No, but in within a movement such as this, there would be a, a type of a, a civil understanding. Because are we not to be under the banner of Christ? Yeah. Are we not to be as soldiers under that banner? Yeah. But when I think of civil authority, I think of that as government, not something within the church, not something within the movement. I'm looking at it more as Christ's organization, not man's. Okay, well, well, we also have there, so we have about a thousand men and women, right? And, Correct. And, and they're all going to be killed. But that's in Shechem. Yeah. We moved on to Thebes. Yeah. So we have a different context. Correct. Because this is Thebes, which is the white raiment. Right. And so this, so this movement is united in purity. And it's going to cast a piece of a millstone upon Abimelech's head. Now, when I looked at this, as I, as I was considering this, this portion... 
the translators would have given reference here to 2 Samuel 11, 21. Of course, who smote Abimelech, the son of Jerubasheth? So you have a third name being applied with Gideon. You have Jerubal, Gideon, and Jerubasheth. Right, which is just the, the um, which Sheth just means shame. It's replacing the name Baal with the name shame. Okay. Right, so that's that's happens other other names they do that too. They just don't want to say Baal, so they put Sheth in there. But this is Abimelech, the son of shame. As in people accepted this message as being to their benefit and they've actually accepted one that is to their shame. Yeah. Did not a woman cast a piece of a millstone upon him from the wall that he died in Thebes? Why went ye nigh on the wall? Why went ye nigh the wall? Why go near the wall? Then say thou, thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So this portion from 2 Samuel is David covering up his sin. Mm -hmm. So this with Abimelech, he's trying to get rid of a message that's exposing his shame. He's trying to present himself in the best light where he does not have a good light. So my question then on this, when we're dealing with a certain woman, could this certain woman be representational of the messages of Ellen White. Well, that, that would make sense. Yeah, I thought of that. Okay, please continue. I said, I thought of that too. It said a certain woman, and then I think Teb is referring to whiteness could be the, be the spirit of prophecy. And as I said in cha a chat, if everybody got united following that, well, of course we'd have unity. Okay, now, what about the symbol of the piece of a millstone? Okay, so well, this is a slice. That's the, the word that's translated as piece. Uh, to cut part off, to slice it, um, to cleave or cut or shred or strike through. So now, and the idea of a millstone, of course, we know what a millstone is. It's used for grinding grain. Um, but this can also refer to uh, part of a chariot and probably maybe the wheel or something like that because of its circular nature like a millstone would have. Um, and it, because this word comes from the word to ride on an animal or a vehicle. So it's kind of a strange um, – and, and the reason why they have it is the upper millstone, that is, it rides on top of the lower millstone. So that's where they get the idea of, of millstone here. The upper, so it's a piece of the upper millstone the one that sits on top, right? Because if people know how a millstone works, uh, you know, a simple millstone, you would have uh, a stone underneath. You would have another millstone with a hole in it. You would put the grain in the top there. You would uh, spin that top millstone, and then the crushed grain would come out at the sides, and, and that would be gathered up. I don't know if anybody's ever 
ground uh, grain, but that would be how that would be done. Okay. So this is a piece of the upper millstone. So as a piece of the upper millstone, would this be a piece of the superior millstone? I'm saying superior versus anterior. Yeah, superior means upper. Right. Yeah. Because you have to have the two stones together hmm. to be able to grind the grain. Yeah. So this is so this stone though represents some kind of information or something, some right. kind of message from the spirit of prophecy. And it's a slice of this upper millstone that uh, destroys this message of Abimelech, uh, his head specifically. Yeah, it's, it's not the entire millstone. Right. And this requires that Abimelech not only come nigh the wall, but he must remain nigh the wall. He has, he has to come near and stay near. Yeah. <clears throat> because if if you know when you're you're thinking of this, here's a certain woman that's going to drop a slice of this millstone from the height of the tower. You can see this action beginning to occur. You would have time to get out of the way. But he chooses not to. He's going to stay near this wall, near this tower. Because he is so convinced of his superiority. He's so convinced of the correctness of his message that he is going to stay near the tower where he has now entrapped all of these men and women. Right. Now, um, so we know that this is going to fulfill the, the prophecy or the curse of Jotham. Right. right. The son of Gideon. And, and we're saying that that message of the prophecy of Jotham is specifically the prophecy regarding 2030. Because it's the seventieth week, he's the seventieth week, and that's that's at least part of the message that we have in the context of the seventieth week. It led us to the first day of the first month in twenty thirty, but it is also the twenty five twenty, because the week of Christ is the twenty five twenty. It's the prophetic mirror, so it's going to be a piece of that message. that's going to cause the end of Abimelech. That is, the whole message doesn't have to be understood. Everything that we're studying right now is, I'm not saying it's not necessary for us to understand it, but I'm just saying that as far as defeating the message of Abimelech, it's not everything that we're studying that has to be seen. There is a piece of that message that will come to play in the end of this message of Abimelech. Right. Which, which to me is hopeful because I mean, I know people aren't studying everything that we're studying, but there is going to be part of what we have studied that will come into play uh, to defeat this false message. Okay.
Now, the message, Abimelech. Then he called hastily unto the young man, his armor bearer, and said unto him, draw thy sword and slay me, that men say not of me, a woman slew him. And his young men thrust him through and he died. And when the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, they departed every man unto his place. So this message does not want it known that it has been defeated by the message of a woman. It is finished by its own servants. It is slain by its own armor bearer, its own servant. And with its um, and with a sword that's a part of its message. Right. Now, here again. This would compare with Saul. Mm -hmm. But how else, what, what other symbols are we seeing in this portion where we're dealing with this young man, his armor bearer, with this sword that thrusts Abimelech through? I mean, his head is crushed. He's been mortally wounded. He just doesn't want to say that that this was the action of a woman. He wants someone else to take responsibility and take credit for his death. So why his armor bearer? Has nobody ever considered this before? Well, I haven't. Um, I mean, literally, it's to lift that which is prepared. That's what an armor bearer is. Wouldn't the armor bearer have also carried a Bimelech shield? Mm -hmm. Was he like a spokesperson and a fall guy? Repeat that, please. Well, I like a spokesperson, like like an aide or a, somebody that promotes the main man, so to speak. And would take the blame if something goes wrong with that main man. Like he's carrying the burden for the main man. He's sheltering, shielding him. Well, it's more like a caddy in golf. I was asking if the armor bearer didn't carry a Bimelech's shield. Well... It's hard to say. Uh, I mean, he's going to carry his weapons and probably his shield, yeah. So the, the armor bearer could have been Abimelech's method of defense. Mm -hmm. So would we look at this that he was slain of his own defense? Possibly. Well, 
if his defense is falsehood, it's not much of a defense. It's just like a refuge of lies that can't prosper. Well, one of the things about this, this message of Abimelech, if we look at it in the context of the message within this movement, um, and we want to talk about a refuge of lies, I mean, part of the, the issue is this belief in unprovable conspiracy theories. And, and these are meant to, I mean, the purpose of conspiracy theories are to exalt self, to put yourself in a special class in the know, so that you cannot, that you can think you're better than others. That's the psychological purpose of conspiracy theories. They're spiritually deadening. They don't help a person see their own sin. They help them focus upon how they're better than others. And it is a type of defense from the truth. And there's all different kinds of ways in which this is done. And, you know, just um, so in the end, um, this is going to be the demise of the message. It's the fact that it was based upon things that weren't true. And that's going to be its undoing. In part. In part. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thus God rendered the wickedness of Abimelech, which he did unto his father in slaying his 70 brethren. And all the evil of the men of Shechem did God render upon their heads, and upon them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jerubal. So the question is, when is this, this false message defeated? Because if this is, this is the fulfillment of the curse of Jotham, um, what would mark its defeat? This is, you know, to mark the, the curse of Jotham or the prophecy of Jotham. The prophecy is given after Abimelech has had three years to run his course. And Abimelech has done nothing more than separate and cause division within these people. Right? Mm -hmm. So the question that I would look at is, are we looking at this as, since there's a time, a time period involved, would we look at this as being uh, occurring after three years of the July 18 message, or do we take this as three years after December 6th? Well, I would say it's three years after the July 18th message, um, but that's also connected to December 6th. Right. Or, or, or and, and of course, um, you know, we, we have all that history is tied together. Everything that had happened, you know, you had the bombing of Nashville, January 6th, 2021. So exactly where we place it, I don't think is important. We don't have a definite time attached to this as far as the symbol of the three years that we have to say it's, you know, 1,080 days or something like that. And we count it from one specific point to another specific point. Um, I mean, maybe we could, but um, it's going to be after the three years that this disaffection occurs, and that's when we're going to see all of this destruction. 
right? So this is going to happen after the three years. This these events within the message, you know, Gaal and Zibol and Abimelech, this part of the message coming against uh, the men in the Tower of Shechem and the men in the Tower of uh, um, whatever it's called again. Uh, Salmon. Right? Yes. Salmon. Or Thebes. Thebes. Yeah, it's going to be Thebes there. That's the place. So, so this is just showing the result of what this rebellion against the message of July 18th is going to result in. But it's going to happen over a, quite a period of time. Game. And we just have this slice of this millstone. So part of this message is going to bring about an end of this message of Abimelech. The that I believe characterizes this false third angel's message. A false righteousness by faith. A false uh, medical missionary work. And also in rejecting July 18th is also tied to this prediction of Trump and the Sunday law and everything happening in this short period of time in which we understand to be symbolic period of time that we haven't even come to midnight. So we can't be talking about a Sunday law yet in, in the immediate future. So we have to wait to see exactly how this occurs, but the fulfillment of the curse of Jotham is inevitable. And we, and, and we think we understand what that, that parable of Jotham is about and what his message is about, that it has to do with the 70th week. That's how I understand it. I mean, we're not getting a lot of discussion on it. I, I think, you know, I'm pretty persistent in how I see this. But I hope that other people see it as well. And if they don't, you know, I would want somebody to explain some other way to look at this. Well, at this, at this point, these last five verses have a lot of symbolic application that I think we're going to have to have some additional discussion upon. Mm -hmm. So as we are coming to the close of today's session, we're going to return to these five verses in the morning. Okay. The assignment for us all is to cover these verses so that we can discuss this and present alternatives. How do we see this? Why do we see it? And defend the position that we're going to take. Mm -hmm. So do we have any other comments or questions at this time? One thing that I've been thinking about since I've been reading through Judges 9 is that when Ellen White writes about Satan's kingdom, the demons are always fighting among themselves. And because, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. So if we're lacking in love and if there's a lot of infighting, we know that Satan has got among our ranks, whether we realize it or not, because you can tell that by the fruits. And this is what we need to be aware of. Like I can't comprehend all of this stuff, but I can see it playing out. And I know that evil always destroys itself ultimately. Okay. And, and this is the difficulty that we have. So one is um, we see the problems that exist. And we know that we have to start with ourselves. Uh, but our actual responsibility, you know, what is it that we're supposed to do? How are we supposed to act? Um, the, you know, that that we've had to struggle with for quite a while. So far, it seems that since there's part of this message, this piece of the message of the upper millstone that is going to 
defeat the, the false message, it's important for us to understand what this millstone represents, and which I think would represent some kind of uh, addressing of the word of God, because the refining of a grain is the study of God's word. And we would know that this has to do with the spirit of prophecy that actually aids us in the study of God's word, which of course is the work of the Holy Spirit, right? Okay. So, so that would have to be, you know, I think is our responsibility is to continue studying and to be open to God's correction. All right. Any other comments? We have a millstone in judgment, too. And we also have, you know, like in the, uh, Matthew 18, 6, where it talks about if you offend one of these little ones that believe on me, they're better than a millstone where, you know, hung around your neck and you were drowned. So it's pretty serious stuff if you want to take it that way, too. Mm -hmm. All right. You think they'll be found in a lie and they'll be taken down by a truth. And uh, because of the embarrassment, they're going to get their own person to take them out. All right. I think that's a, a point worth covering. Okay, shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we have spent together. I thank you for the comments that have come, the questions that have come, and for these examples that are being presented before us. Please be with us today. Help us to consider this which we have studied. Help us pre prepare to assemble again before you tomorrow. May your will be done. May it be your character which is shown to all that we come in contact with. I ask your blessing upon each that have been here today and those that will view this later, direct us now. May your will be done in our lives and in our efforts. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.